we are live. Uh, that's what the green little button means at the top. And this is, uh, I say it every week. I'm going to continue to say it. It's my favorite part because you see everybody's name pop up and it's like the numbers are just rolling over. Um, we have a ton of people logging in to this call today. Um, could be something to do with our panelists on screen here and what they have to tell us and what we're interested in learning. Um, so um, we're going to wait a little while to give people time to log in because there's a lot of them coming. A um, lot of names that uh, have been on our calls since the end of March. Um, I can't believe it's December. Uh -huh. well, before we before we get started, Sherry, I, I wanted to just take a second and thank you. Uh, you started this back in the end of March and have had a, a webinar for the travel industry to stay connected every single week except for holidays. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's been amazing. 36 different events that you have hosted uh, over the course of this pandemic and uh, over uh, nearly 2000 different individuals have logged in at one time or another. And we've got about 400 people signed up today. And I think it's just a, a real tribute to you for uh, keeping the industry connected and, and keeping out front. And it's been fascinating to watch that conversation evolve. So I'm really looking forward to today because this same group was together back in, we said June, right? June, so, early June. Yeah, well, a thanks, lifetime ago. thank you, Will. It has, it has been fun and every, it's everyone on these calls that keep logging in week after week. Um, and it's all of the operators and suppliers that have given their time to, to be on the call and to talk and share um, I mean, it's, it's like a big round table. It's like a big sales call. You know, it gives us an opportunity to really stay engaged with, with what's happening. Um, and I love, I love everyone logging in and, and saying thank you and thank you for logging on because that's, that's what's important. If you don't log on, then these don't really mean anything. So, um, so, so we appreciate the continued attendance here. Um, you can see everyone logging in from all over the country, which I love. Um, Vegas and Chicago and Minneapolis and you know, Alaska. Scott, thank you for getting up this morning and logging in to be with us. Um, we, um, as Will mentioned, you know, had a conversation about what industry events looked like in June. And I went back and watched that um, to find out what everybody said. And we were all very optimistic, which I think we still are. Um, but, but we were optimistic that we weren't going to have to make that many changes, that we were going to remain safe and remain socially distanced and, and look at what we needed to do moving into 2021. Um, and I think we now know that that's a little different. So we wanted to, to group together again and, and see where, where we're at right now and what events look like next year and dates of events. Um, we were joking before we started the call that uh, that Pete made a, a comment of, yeah, yeah, we're looking at alternative events. And then a few months later, we had to pull the trigger on those uh, alternative dates um, for ABA, but how smart he was at that point to do it. Um, so as we always do, um, first, I should thank Betsy Cooper, who for all 36 of these webinars from Tour Operator Land has sponsored us. and. And, and helped recruit buyers to, to be on it. So if you don't know anything about Tour Operator Land, Betsy's gonna put her information in the chat. You should definitely take a look at it. It's a great way for itineraries to be posted and royalty-free photos, which we all know tour operators ask for 24 seven when they're putting stuff together. Um, but we're gonna start and let everyone um, introduce themselves, talk a little bit about your show and what focus, I mean, I think that might be repetitive. Everybody knows you guys and knows what you do, but I'm going to have you do it anyway, just for the good of the order. Um, and as questions come in, if you could keep them um, in the Q&A, that makes it really easy for me to find and ask our panelists. Um, but if you put them in chat, I will look for them there as well. Um, so Malcolm, in my screen, you're the upper left-hand corner. So that's what you're doing. We're going to start with you. <laughs> right. Well, thanks for having me again. And we were just talking, as you said, before we got on the call, that well, it seems like a lifetime since June, and I'm, I'm glad you reviewed it because I have no idea what 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 I said or what we we all talked about. Sounded really than, smart. Other than uh, we thought Peter was being overly uh, cautious by having him back <laughs> and, uh, for June of this year. So, um, anyways, I, I saw the list of, of attendees, and I, it looks like the vast majority are are usual suspects at IPW. So glad to have them on. Um, we're feeling like the third time will be a charm for Las Vegas. Um, we too, two months ago, 
uh, started to see the writing on the wall, obviously overly uh, concerned because of our, the international base of our audience, their ability to get to the United States, um, as well as, as back uh, even in September, we weren't even sure when, when vaccines would be uh, approved. So we went ahead and, and took that, that jump to, to move our dates um, with a, a big thank you to the Las Vegas CVA for helping us do that and Brand USA, Travel Nevada, everyone for being so supportive of that. Uh, it was funny because we did this huge like FAQ page because you know for press inquiries or or um, delegate inquiries, and now I we don't everyone knows why we move. There there is uh, no one questioning why we're not trying to do an international show next May. So um, thanks for for having me back. It's good to see uh, the rest of the panelists too, and and you know hopefully next time we get together, someone's actually executed a large event. Right, and we're in person and can say hi to each other. That would be awesome. Uh -huh. Uh, Pete, let's uh, let's go to ABA. Thanks, Sherry. Good to be here. Good to see everybody again on the panel. Um, I do have to correct you, though. You said I was smart by moving our dates to June of 2021. I, you know, as they say, even a blind squirrel can find an acorn, and that's about <laughs> what happened. Um, you know, we were we were also very blessed that we had such a great partner in Baltimore, Al Hutchinson, who runs the CVB and. His whole team and all of our partners out there were, were so magnanimous about working with us really from the very beginning. We started that process the end of March. We identified the fact that you know we weren't sure what COVID was going to be, how long it was going to last. And we said, just in case, we need to start looking at alternative dates because we weren't sure if January of 21 was going to work or not. And obviously, as, as we talked about this past June and we made the final decision at our board meeting in uh, in September of this year to change those dates. So first of all, thank you to the uh, to the friends in Baltimore. So we're looking forward to it. It's going to be uh, it's going to be in June. It's going to be the the 19th through or the 18th rather through the 22nd. Uh, we're also adding a very different show that we've never had before, which is a, an equipment show focused on bus and motor coach transportation and all bus, not just motor coach, but school bus transit. So it'll be a, a completely different show, but run in parallel with, uh, with Marketplace. And uh, you know, we think it'll be a game changer in the industry. We're still gonna have a fabulous Marketplace, still gonna be you know, the biggest group travel show uh, for North American travel in the, in the country, but uh, adding this other component brings a whole nother dimension to it. So we're, we're thrilled, we're looking forward to seeing everybody in person. I love that. So two things to add to that. Baltimore was one of my favorite ABAs when it was there before. Yeah. I was there um, with a previous employer, Visit Tampa Bay, um, and it's right after Baltimore won the Super Bowl. And That's right, the one, the that, the one that, we, that weekend yeah. when we were there, they actually won. They did, and, and the only song you heard throughout the entire city was Who Let the Dogs Out 24-7, uh, but I loved it. It was so much fun to be there then. Um, and um, the other thing you've been working on um, quite a bit since the last time we talked is Buses Move America. And I wanted to congratulate you on that because that has really done wonders for the bus industry and in getting information out there for travel. Well, well we appreciate it. And, I, and, you know, not to take up too much time, but as everybody knows, I mean, the whole travel industry has been decimated. No question about it. Not, not you know, saying anything new. But the motor coach side of that uh, has probably taken even a bigger hit. I mean, most of our companies across the board are operating at somewhere between five and 10%. And we've been spending a lot of time, a lot of time up on Capitol Hill, uh, getting our message up there, uh, getting it out to our members. And you know, right now we're looking at potentially somewhere between five and $10 billion in, in some relief for the industry, uh, assuming they, 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 they get the stimulus package done before next Friday, the 18th, when they go out of session for the year. So we're hopeful, we got our fingers crossed, but there's so many people that I saw logging in uh, who have been a part of this. It's not just the motor coach industry, but it's the group travel industry who have really moved the dial by weighing in with their senators and their members of, of the house. So thank you everybody who's been a part of that effort. Yeah, I've lo I love how um, this industry always comes together when, when we we need it and that's the epitome of the hashtag tourism strong so we're strong right. together certainly um ca what's going on with sida yeah. yeah well i guess i think when we met last we were just uh canceling our conference in winnipeg yeah and so i think we were among the first to have to really um after malcolm take that hit so 
again, great partners in Winnipeg. We're excited. We'll be back there in 2023. Um, but I think we were also one of the first to do Site Alive. So we pivoted as the word everyone's using and right away had a live event over the date of the Monday that would have been our conference and just had a great opportunity to bring in a lot of our members and uh, we had over 400, 500 registered. And it, what was really neat is that the Broadway community came together and offered what usually is the highlight of our conference. And we had actors, actresses, singers, students, everyone really joining in. So it was really wonderful to take advantage and show everybody that we could still stay connected as a community through the virtual platform. And I know many of us are using different kinds. That was very exciting. And then right after that, our foundation had an event with our band. And so our famous Sida band recorded a song from all over the country. And I think it was an opportunity to show everyone that the technology is out there. And whether we meet in person or virtually, the hospitality community comes together and supports one another. So we've had a great experience. We're hoping that uh, next year we will be in New York City in August. And again, like you, hoping to welcome our members back together in such a great city. So thank you for having me back. Oh, thank you for being here. Um, and last but not least, my fearless leader, Will, what's happening in Connect Travel? Because I don't know. You have no idea. Well, yeah. stuff, uh, I think, Caroline, that's just some, some really cool, innovative, innovative ideas. And I think that's something that... Um, our industry is going to uh, is going to really tap into moving forward. I mean, we we were really fortunate to obviously have our big event in February with President Obama, probably one of the last big industry events uh, of 2020. Um, but then we came back and had uh, a, an event last month. Um, we had five events co-located in Orlando, and um, just to prove that you could host a live in-person event, and it was it was very different. I mean, you, you, there's a um, you know, hand sanitizers and cleaning stations and everybody wearing masks and, you know, the food and all the experiences were very different. But I will tell you that our industry, uh, you could see the smiles behind the masks. Everybody was eager to get together and do business. So I, I was really encouraged about that. Um, Caroline, some of those examples, I think, are, are really, really interesting. Um, we, we have an event called eTourism Summit, our digital tourism marketing conference. And this year we, we made that 21 days of content. So it was content every day of the month of October virtually, and we're able to expand our footprint and talk to so many more people that than would otherwise come to a live in-person event. So that's a positive. Uh, we had the live and in-person version of eTourism Summit in Orlando in November, much smaller, but again, everybody eager to, to get the wheels of commerce going again. Um, our Connect Thrive Summit, which is our LGBTQ travel show, uh, was also in um, live and in-person in Orlando. And um, very, very much smaller than we would have had last year uh, when, when we launched it. But we, we, we ended up shooting um, seven uh, episodes of different podcasters of leaders within the community. And, and then those leaders broadcasting that Thrive Summit content out to their audiences. Again, we, we will touch many, many times more people than we would have uh, with just a live event. So I think the kind of things that you did, Carol Ann, and I think that we, we explored with a lot of different live streaming options as well. Um, we're going to see our events uh, evolve into different ways. And I think if we look at it as opportunities uh, to partner together, look at opportunities to expand the reach of our, of our um our attendees, both live and virtual, uh, that's a really, really exciting time for the travel industry coming into 21 and beyond. And Will, I'll make a comment because I did attend it. Congratulations on doing a really safe, comfortable uh, conference. But I can't tell you how good it actually felt to put my out of office on and to mean <laughs> it and to travel there and to be engaged and not distracted because I guarantee the majority of people on this call right now are probably also doing emails, probably doing texts, trying to pay attention. <laughs> Not <If> our those... <laughs> participants, no. Hey, well, we might be doing it ourselves. <laughs> um, but to, to be focused on marketing, and that's where the big ideas come from, you know, when you're not distracted, when you're all there listening to the same thing, speech, and you're talking, uh, or presenters, and you're, you're talking with people and sharing that experience, that really, it just reminded me that, that that's why conferences are so, that's worth the idea. Absolutely. So 
it's almost like you guys talking about virtual, um, you knew exactly what my next question or topic was going to be. Uh, before we get into changes of in-person events next year, um, virtual was, was a, huge, a, a huge way that we stayed connected throughout this entire year. Um, and I think every, every major conference, you know, at some point had, had a virtual component to it from regional shows like Go West to, um, to CIDA. Um, I know Malcolm, a U.S. travel had a virtual component um, this year, and maybe not for IPW, but, you know, for keeping in touch. Um, is that something, I mean, it, it was successful. We pulled it off. We kept people together. Is that something that goes away in 2021 or 2022 or is a hybrid model is it something that's here to stay forever to will's point you know what um what are you doing next year that has a virtual component to it anyone well i'll start with this because we just also had our our u.s travel board meeting uh two weeks ago and liz warwick who is event marketing consultants and she had many many years at liberty mutual uh spoke to to the group and uh, it's really great insight um, that she had, but she said, you know, virtual's with us for a while. It's gonna be part of 21. Now she had a good point. It's gonna be dialed up at times. It's gonna be dialed down depending on audience, on time of year and so forth. Um, and for instance, with IPW being in September, uh, we are working behind the scenes to have a virtual component to it, but being, you know, nine, 10 months out, we have no idea what, what how we're gonna dial that up or down. Uh, I just spent yesterday, our team spent the calls with our international advisory chairs, the, the recruitment offices around the globe uh, by regions. And, you know, we shared that with them as well. It's just too early to know what it is. Um, so what we plan on doing is really reaching out uh, to our international offices uh, in May and June and really try to get a feel for what's happening in markets. Are there some markets that are slower getting vaccines? Are there still some travel restrictions um, that countries have imposed perhaps on the U.S.? Is there a significant amount of buyers who want to come but just don't have the financial ability? And we'll make our decisions there. I mean, we are certainly more challenged being a global event that, that is appointment-based because of time zones. Um, Brand USA did a wonderful job with your European Travel Week. Um, but again, you're, you're dealing with time zones that are manageable. When you start getting to, to literally opposite time zones uh, of the United States, it becomes really, really challenging. So while we certainly... Um, think we'll have a, a good in-person turnout. That is certainly our goal. We will be adaptive, um, like I said, by, by about June to make some decisions on do we need to, to do a virtual registration and what does that look like? Yeah, I can. If I can jump in, I, th I think Malcolm's right. I mean, virtual is always going to be there, right? It's not going away. It's going to change how we do business going forward. I mean, we were, we were here lucky enough that we, we had our show in January. So it was before COVID came or anybody knew about it. But since that time, we've done over 100 webinars as a way to engage with all of our members. Next year, we will have a virtual component that leads into the in-person component in, in uh, June. But we've also got webinars and, and seminars and other educational opportunities on the books. In fact, we've got between now and June, over 100 scheduled for the next six or seven months. So it's always going to be a part of what we do going forward. I, I love that. Hold on. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Caroline. Pete said, I think the opportunity that the virtual has given us is you're always struggling with how much education you can offer. People don't know which session to go to. And from a space perspective, you may not be able to have as many sessions as you had before with COVID. So I think tying in the virtual gives us that opportunity to connect the education in different ways to offer certification and whatever those kinds of programs are, you can now extend your conference, for example, as ABA is and others have done with those opportunities and not worry about paying lots of fees for speakers on site where maybe you could offer them virtually and everybody could take advantage of it. So I like to think out of it as a, maybe a silver lining and some things that we never would have done before that add additional value. And I'm wondering when we finally get face to face, if no one's gonna wanna go into an education room because they haven't seen anybody. So how we balance connecting everybody in person and offering so much. So I think that piece of it's staying. And I would say also that I think the virtual made us content providers that maybe we were before. I'm not sure 
like other associations in the engineering and healthcare space, we're very focused on content. And I don't know if we thought of ourselves that way, but we produce amazing content across all of our shows virtually that I think we may not have done before or wouldn't have thought about. So I now see the travel industry is really providing great content to communities as resources. So again, just I think something else we've learned about our industry as a result of this. I, I agree. I think I think it's a tool that only enhances what mm -hmm. what we do moving forward. Um, and I was going to jump in because thank you, Malcolm, for mentioning Brand USA and their virtual event because they did do a great job with it. And Jim, uh, thank you. I have NTA and their dates written down on my notes here, and I forgot to mention that they had their virtual event November 17th through the 19th, and they did an amazing job. I heard very, very good things about it and, and the appointments that went through. Um, and they are coming back with a live and in-person event next year in November. So it looks like they'll have plenty of time um, throughout next year to get that event in person in Cleveland, the 14th through the 17th of November as well. So I did want to mention that. Um, virtually, Will, um, obviously you talked about ETS and it goes hand in hand with what Carol Ann said about developing content. Um, do you see us moving into, you know, continuing to do that throughout next year? I know that we're keeping our webinars. I will be on every Thursday for as long as we need to stay connected. Um, so, you know, what, um, how do you see virtual playing into the events that we have on the books next year? I think Carol Ann made a, a really good point that in terms of content, uh, it, it's no longer limited to, you know, two or three days on site. And I think, uh, and really what we're seeing in, in these pandemic times uh, is that the marketplace is changing so fast. Um, you know, it's, it's funny when we planned eTourism Summit, uh, we had the entire set of content, you know, ready to roll in, in, in April. Um, for, a, for a September event. Well, you know, that content we planned was, had zero relevance by the time, you know, we got to October. So it's changing very fast, not only our markets, but the educational needs are changing. So I think we're gonna see, at least from our Connect Travel um, side, and I think really uh, industry-wide in the travel industry and many other industries, that, um, that ongoing education is going to be more and more important. It's gonna be kind of a part and parcel. I think, um, again, from a, connect travel perspective, the fact that on your 37th webinar, you've got over 200 people uh, have logged in, double that registered. You know, I mean, it's remarkable when you're providing real valuable content. So I think that whole content is king is going to be a, a thing. I think it, um, it's gonna allow us to enable um, kind of engagement with our communities on a 365 days a year uh, model instead of um, just three days. Uh, I even think through all the you know, 28 sessions that we did for eTourism Summit virtual, um, those are now all up on, on our website, right? So people are going back in and, and refreshing their ideas. So, um, but even then, um, you know, the content from a year ago, not, not so relevant. It's changing so fast that I think our roles as associations and, and event producers uh, becomes more than just the event. And that, that'll be long lived uh, change in our business, I believe. I think a challenge um, will going into 2021 for all of us who are doing anything virtual webinars and so forth is is the challenge to keep people engaged because there is fatigue with with zoom calls and um, uh, virtual conferences so how do you keep the person engaged we've all like I said become masters of multitasking while we're on calls um, but I find you know virtual events where there's appointments um, where there's polling going on keeps people engaged uh, where there's breakout um, networking groups, we see that with our board too. When we when we break out into to breakout groups on Zoom, even that five minutes of transition while we wait for people to to pop in there, just seeing the board members interacting with each other because we we miss it so much. So I, I think it's finding ways to keep the audience engaged, and you have to kind of, we're going to have to continue to figure out how do we evolve virtual into 21 so we don't lose people. Yeah, absolutely, I, I couldn't agree with that more. And I think Caroline made another really cool point is is what kind of content do you want when you are live and in person? I mean, it's more workshoppy than, you know, present presenty. It's more hands-on interaction, engagement, rather than um, you know, listening to great speakers. We can, you know, bring those great speakers to uh, with great compelling content, much like you had Malcolm last week with Adam Sachs. I mean, really compelling, timely, relevant content. Um, that's going to be 
and that keeps you uh, really, really focused and engaged. So I think, again, that timeliness of, of information is going to be critical moving forward. So I'm going to come back to you, Pete, because you mentioned that you have a virtual component moving moving into prior to ABA in June. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we, we want to give... Uh, we want to give people the ability to connect with one another. We want to make sure, you know, it's not just a one-year event and that they connect throughout the year. So those that are signed up for Marketplace, uh, which is going to be in June, will have the opportunity from the end of January on to be part of a, a an event that takes place for the next four or five months. Um, so we're looking forward to that. We think it's a game changer. It's a different way of doing business. They'll be able to do some appointments with one another. Um, it won't be at a, an appointment event, but it will be connecting buyers and sellers together. And, uh, and we think it'll be uh, something pretty unique in the industry. Nobody else has been doing it so far. Nobody else, I don't think, will be doing it until we do. So. I, I love it. So basically, um, people will be able to have an opportunity to, to chat and, and have all of those preliminary conversations that you have in your one appointment and then have to follow up on later. That's so you're right. having okay. all the conversations beforehand, so it makes your in-person event even more specific and yeah, it's, it's even a, total a better ROI. Exactly, total enhancement to the uh, to the in-person event. And the other thing we're doing in person that I think is very very different is it's one price per company. You know, we used to charge one price for every delegate that came. Now one company pays one price, and they can bring as many people as they want. So we think it's a tough time. It's a difficult time for everybody. We want to make it easier for people to come and participate and more people to come and, and join together, obviously. I, I thank you for leading me into my next question. It's like you guys, we planned this, but we really didn't. I promise. Um, it was uh, we have a question from Teresa, who is, you know, with revenues low in 2020, do you believe companies will have the resource mm -hmm. to attend your shows? Um, so that was going to lead me into, you know, what are you doing um, and have you made any changes for suppliers and buyers alike so, so they have the opportunity to be at the shows next year? And, and Pete, you kicked us off and told us what you were doing. Does anybody else have, have anything to add there? Well, I'm going to add a comment to that, too, because it's absolutely gut-wrenching to me when you see companies that cut marketing and sales first. Um, you know, that's the, that's the engine that keeps the business going. I don't care if you're in the motor coach business, hotel business, or making widgets. You know, if you can't sell them, you're not making anything. So you've got to keep that part strong. Uh, you've got to keep it going. And, and I know that some companies don't do that. It's one of the first things they cut. You know, people need to be prepared for recovery. And we're all in the business, especially in the group travel business that we're all part of, of planning long term. Well, that planning process has already started. I mean, I can tell you some of our larger tour operators are, are, are putting out their catalogs and they've got, they're doing sales for 2022. If you're not in the game, if you're not selling and marketing right now, regardless, I understand the budgets are tight, but if you're not in that space, you're, you're already done for 2022, let alone 21. Peter, that's such a good point. I, I, I brought some stats from Tourism Economics from that, that webinar last week with Adam Sachs. You know, we're in such an unusual time that we are in the depth of a crisis that we know it's going to get worse in the next few months. But I, we've never been in a position where we know there is a big rebound coming and we can almost pinpoint the date of it. It's basically starting second quarter and starting to roar in third and fourth quarter of 21. So what Adam shared on the call last week, I mean, we're one month away from or a few weeks away from 2021. So we can almost say 2022 is next year. In 2022, Tourism Economics is predicting that leisure travel in the United States will exceed 2019. That is huge. Um, and that international will be back to 85% of 2019. This is in a very close horizon for us. And as Peter said, you know, we, we've got to find a way to get off the sidelines and start stop treading water and start planning to get our fair share of this. Um, but I understand, I understand budgets are very difficult. We're working really hard because our international tour operators have been decimated like, like all of us. Um, so we, we've reduced registration for them by 70% to try to get them to in person to the show. Uh, domestically, for our exhibitors, we've, we've held rates flat. As uh, much as I would like to be able to go down, we are going to be doing social distancing um, even for September. I, I think we have to plan that way. If things improve, we can make some, some changes. But we're going in very cautiously. So we will have less space to sell. 
Uh, we are going to include a lot of safety measures that are going to be part of, of uh, booth packages, including plexiglass for now. These things are all very expensive. Safe shows are, are certainly not cheap. But what we're trying to do to, to be more inclusive, uh, we were about to launch something called the Express Booth for 2020 before we canceled. And the Express Booth was a turnkey option intended for a first time exhibitor or somebody who wants to go from a booth share to their own booth. But we're opening up to everybody now because we would rather have them there in Express Booth than not participate at all. Um, so that's probably the, the biggest change we're doing the exhibitor side to, to um, get them in. And then, you know, we're also trying to add a lot of value to the show as well, making education a very large component of it, um, doing a massive overhaul of our appointment schedule to allow a lot more networking time so people can get out of the show what they need to get out of the show and tailor it to their needs. Uh, appointments will still be the core of it, but there's a lot more that people are going to need in 21. If they can only go to a handful of shows, we've tried to, we have to try to provide as much value as possible. Yeah, that's, that's really important. Um, and to add to that, you know, since we were able, had to cancel last August, for us, we took a look at our membership dues and we took a look at conference registration and decided to offer business appointments to those companies who could renew their membership. So rather than trying to charge two fees, you know, for a smaller organization like ours, we're looking at, can we bundle and do some value added packaging for different organizations to participate. And so we're also looking not just at what we charge for events, but what we charge for membership and how can we put these packages together that will work for our partners, you know, moving forward, just like one price for as many people to come. Can we do something more creative with pricing in 21 and 22, you know, helping everybody get started. So I think I appreciate all of us taking a look at these budgets and, and I think even how we can partner together to work together to help the entire community be successful, certainly for next year. Couldn't, couldn't agree with you more there. We have um, one, one uh, we have a couple of questions, but one I'm gonna come back to you, Pete, because Kelly um, is a state DMO, she represents everybody. So she's really curious to know where she can find more information about the virtual event before Marketplace, because she'd like to, and I think this is a great idea. She'd like to showcase all of her different communities throughout that time that, that don't have the budget to, to attend Marketplace. So she can go to our website, buses.org, B-U-S-E-S.org, click on the Marketplace tab, and then also but for marketplace on demand, that's what we're calling it. So it'll it'll include virtual appointment sessions. Uh, it'll be online research, the online research database, which we normally would hold until marketplace will be open during that period. Again, for people that are registered to come to marketplace, uh, there'll be a virtual trade show floor. There'll be virtual education sessions. There'll be opportunities for people to reconnect. So think of it as an in-person marketplace online, not or an extra cost, but it's something that enhances your marketplace experience that you've already signed up for. And there'll be, I'm sure there'll be some other pieces that we're still gonna be rolling out, but uh, we're excited to offer it as an enhancement to what's already gonna be done. I love that. And, and Kelly, and for everyone else on this call, in addition to Kelly, we'll make sure in our follow-up and the, and the takeaways that we do after our call that we have all of that information and websites listed so you can get to it easily. Um, and, and Will, I know that um, I'm going to let you talk about our events and what, and what we're doing differently, but I do think that um, one of the major things is, you know, we're co-locating everything next year. Um, I think um, that's, that's something that we're doing from, from not only a Connect Travel, but a Connect Meetings perspective. Yeah, I think uh, there's no there's no question that we're we're uh, looking at you know there's a great saying universal uh, disruption is a great time for reinvention and so it's a it's an opportunity for us to really look and see how we can execute and um, and deliver exceptional events um, in a in a very dynamic world. So we're excited about the partnership opportunities. Uh, we 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 did that again in, in November with co-locating five events. Um, everyone builds off each other. I think there's some great examples around the industry of uh, organizations that are partnering together. Um, and I'm excited to, to do some partnering next year as well, Malcolm. Right. Do you want to? I was going to say, are one, if one of you guys going to talk about what you're hinting at? Yeah, or... well, why don't we? Why don't we? And, and again, this goes back to why um, big things happen at conferences. So we were together 
in Orlando last month and we were talking about you know where where their show is going to be next year um, and it hadn't been decided and we have a lot of synergies in our audiences and organizations who, who attend both of our events so we started crazy ideas like well why don't we have you come do some events at IPW and be in Vegas for that week and you know what turned into crazy idea is about to be uh, a, a, an official announcement uh, this afternoon so really thrilled um, that we're going to have the Connect Tour uh, integrated into IPW. We've done a lot of outreach to our exhibitors, um, some of which are on this call and also on our advisory group, that that they're wearing multiple hats now. You know, staffs have been decimated and the, the days of having the luxury of having an international wholesale sales manager, domestic sales manager, group sales manager, you know, in many times it's one person wearing all hats. So um, we're hearing that domestic is obviously very important to them in 21. Um, you know, I think after hearing Adam Sachs presentation last week from Tourism Economics, people might have a little different mindset and be uh, more, more engaged and international again. And uh, if you want your, that international business 22, 23, you need to be at IPW this year. But Connect Tour does give a, a domestic component too. People want to opt into that and do both. So it goes back to a little bit of what I was talking about before is that we're trying to provide more value so people can tailor IPW in that week to their specific needs and what they need to do to, to recover and grow. So also um, won't be located in the show, but adjacent to the show, uh, Connect Thrive and eTourism Summit. So Will, those are your babies. So if you want to touch a little bit more on those, please do. Yeah, I mean, I th again, it's uh, trying to bring as much of the travel industry together as possible. So eTourism Summit is uh, it's celebrated 20 years this year. It's be 20 or 21 years this year. It'll be uh, 22 years old uh, next year. And it's a right, premier conference for digital tourism marketers, uh, really education focused and helping connect the industry uh, with all the technology and um, all the amazing systems that uh, allow tourism marketers to do their thing. So that'll be uh, co-located at at IPW, as will Connect Thrive Summit, which is our LGBTQ travel, sports, and entertainment event, uh, will be the two days preceding um, IPW. So it's, a, again, a great opportunity to bring together a lot of that, continue to innovate. Uh, really excited to see um, you know, how we can create as many synergies as we can for the industry, as many opportunities to connect with multiple sectors of um, of the industry, uh, really to give, a, give the jump start to 20, 2022, and I, I like you took a lot out of uh, Adam Sachs's presentation. That you know, not only you know, it, this is a time to pull back on international. There's going to be over 50 million international visitors in 2022, international inbound visitors in 2022. So it's more critical now than ever to to fight for those that share, uh, but also to be able to build in, to build domestic at the same time, build your, your marketing savvy, and uh, and connect to new niche audiences is a huge opportunity. Yeah, and, and actually, I, I, to correct myself on the stat that I shared, 2022 international will be back to 66% of 2019 and 2023 at 85%. So I just wanted to, to clarify that. But I, I think, you know, the, the, for all of us who are able to execute in-person event next year, you know, inclusivity is really the word that I think we all need to use. Um, we've already had conversations with IITA about providing some uh, educational content. Uh, I'd love to have more discussions with, with uh, CIDA and ABA. We've had some conversations with NTA. Uh, just how can we all come together to, to add more value to the events that are happening? Um, we, we've all got to kind of get through this together and help the industry get through 21 together and hope that we start seeing some semblance of normalcy as we go into, into uh, 2022. I, I was going to no, tag on to the same thing. Historically, Pete and Carol Ann, ABA and CIDA has had a presence um, at IPW as well. And so how do we expand on that and, and all come together as an industry to, to kickstart it, you know, from all of the suppliers and all of the associations and how do we work together to really position ourselves for that 85% that turnaround in 2023. Um, and Malcolm, Art um, um, just posted that if you could post those stats or make sure that I have them, um, that I can put them in our follow-up, that would be great. So, so they yeah, the, I'll, I'll send a link. The entire presentation is on the website and I believe it's available to members and non-members. Um, so I'll, I'll share that link at the end of this. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so now let's get into the down and dirty of what our shows look like. You know, we're, we're all planning an in-person event. Um, how is that going to look? 
what's it going to be? I mean, clearly we're not going to be in a room at a banquet table with tons of people eating elbow to elbow, right? So, you know, what kind of changes are we making to maintain um, social distance, health and safety, but still have an event that is successful? Um, and Greg specifically has um, a question that came up about sponsorship. He wants to know what the sponsorship landscape is going to look like for in-person trade shows. We all put on trade shows. We know how critically important that is. Um, and that sponsorship allows us to create the experience. So how are we going to balance that next year? And what experience should people be prepared for? Uh, do you mind if I go to share screen, Sarah? I, you can absolutely go to share screen. Okay, because we are actually doing a very major schedule revamp, uh, very much with that in mind. Um, for those who attend IPW, you know normally your day is scheduled from the moment you walk in that door to the moment you leave. First appointments sometimes as early as 8.30 and sometimes don't end until 5.50 in the afternoon. So big revamp. Appointments, like I said, still going to be the core of the show, but the first appointment won't start till 10 a.m. So that opens up almost an hour and a half, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning um, for, for people to pick and choose what they need to get out of IPW. So like I mentioned, the uh, uh, strong educational program going. But to sponsorships, we'd already seen over the past few years a big move of people wanting more experiential um, to activation zones, uh, engagement zones. And we really want to build that up. We we had the amazing California Plaza uh, in 2019. How do we keep that theme moving forward going into uh, 2020? So it, the, the challenge used to be there wasn't a whole bunch of time for our delegates to interact with the activation zones. Well, this year, there's going to be, once you total up, it's, it's almost eight hours of networking time that can be built in where they can visit these sponsors, interact, looking to put the marketing and technology pavilion in the same type of area that people can interact with when they have open time and do more demos and be, be interacting more casually necessarily than, than an appointment. Um, and, and to your point, Sherry, of, of uh, you know, IPW, we certainly, I don't think anyone wants to dine with 6,000 people at 10 Tops. Uh, crammed in, friends, so. crammed in yeah. as tight as the fire marshal will allow next year. So um, we want to be very sensitive to that. So we're looking to break the uh, the audience into three breaks during the luncheons. So about fifteen hundred at a time going to lunch versus you know five six thousand, using the same amount of space so we can space people out and and condensing our presentations and entertainment to about twenty minutes. So there's another 30, 40 minutes of networking. So you know, back to the, to the sponsorship question, it, for us, it's gonna be creating a lot more opportunities for engagement and interaction. Um, you know, things like advertising and banners are still popular, but the, the direction is, is how can people interact? And California Plaza was a home run. People talked about it from both the, the sponsor side, who, you know, the, the partners that were in there, but so did the buyers and the press, they loved it. So that's something that, that we're gonna head more in that direction. And it just got a shout out on the chat as well. I'm glad you mentioned California because I was, I was gonna refer back to that as well. Um, so you're splitting the lunch up into three. We did box lunches, grab and go. Um, and, and I need to call out um, the Royal Pacific in Orlando, a Lowe's property that did an amazing job with a box lunch to make it safe and taste good. And it was amazing for all of the people that were at our event. Um, do you see box lunches in our future for all of our shows? And I'll let Carol Ann and Pete jump in as well. Well, go ahead, Pete, you'll be up first. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all eyes are on the yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, Malcolm covered it. I think. I mean, we're we're all gonna have, we're all looking at how we how we redesign our shows, right? We we can't have people jammed in together in the same way that we have before. We can't have them crossing over each other. You know, we're probably not going to have at our show people slicing cheese and slicing spam and slicing everything else and and handing it out. I mean. Are they going to be dipping ice cream, Pete? Because, you know, that was my favorite booth, but probably not, right? Well, I, I hope that doesn't go away. You know, it's my favorite booth, too. Um, but, you know, we're just going to all, we're all going to have to look at that and how we do it. And, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in the best scenario, in a best Christmas dream, we hope that we're back to normal. But that's probably not going to happen. And we've got a plan for the, the new normal, whatever that new normal might be. 
Um, so we're, you know, we're all looking at the same thing, I think, right now. We're all reviewing, you know, what are the best practices? What are other meeting planners doing? You know, what are other shows doing? I mean, nice to see what, what, what Malcolm's doing, what IPW is going to be doing going forward. And hopefully we can have more collaboration with all of our partners, you know, have, who have been doing shows kind of the same way for a long time and how we can change and make it an even better experience. Oh, I will go back too, to, to Greg's question about sponsorship. I mean, one of the bright lights that we've begun to see over the last, I'll say over the last couple of weeks in particular, is more interest in sponsorships. I mean, more people coming back, all of a sudden people saying, yeah, I want to be there. I need to be there. You know, it's the end of the year. They're starting to realize that, hey, if they want to be in the game, as we talked about, you know, next year and the year after that and the year after that, they got to be at the show and they got to participate. So, you know, sponsorships are, are starting to come back uh, and we're grateful for that, obviously. You know, as um, you were talking, you know, we're definitely a smaller show and we're scheduled to be in New York City, uh, you know, at the Sheridan, which is a great property and, but certainly doesn't have the wide hallways and density that the convention centers have. But one of the things we're looking at doing is, you know, we've been talking a lot to our customers about how we're gonna travel their kids safely. So what we're looking at doing is actual live demonstrations of how we're going to do that. So taking groups to a hotel or, doing a live demonstration on a motor coach or taking them to an attraction. So rather than trying to get everybody in the ballroom together to hear, taking groups out into the field and demonstrating to the operators and the suppliers how we think these health and safety protocols are gonna work for our customers and our passengers, because we'll hopefully be kicking off really the first fall year for student travel. We're still struggling a bit with kids for next spring, but you know, those kinds of things where a sponsor or a partner, you know, we can show how things are gonna work, you know, take some video and really put to the test what we've been saying we're gonna be able to do with these students. So I, I see it as a great opportunity, even though we may be in a small space to take it out into the street and take advantage of smaller group demonstrations and the time to you know, work around the city. And that certainly means adjustments into schedules and things like that. So, you know, like everyone, we're trying to maximize what's the value, but at the same time, do something a little bit different so that when they come, they'll have a new experience. And I think we're gonna have to show customers, just like our meetings will demonstrate how to have a meeting safely. We're gonna have to show in group travel how we're actually gonna do that safely. And that's one of the things we hope to achieve, you know, with our conference next August. And, and, and that sounds to me, Carolyn, I mean, not only doing that at the conference, but that sounds like content you're generating to you virtually, you know, with teachers uh, across the U.S. Yeah, and it'll be really important for getting our customers feeling comfortable again. Absolutely. That, that has been a, a reoccurring theme. There's been some great partners in the, in the travel industry that have been providing really, really powerful research over the course of the, this entire year uh, from destination analysts to Longwoods and Miles and Adar, and they've done a ton of really good research. And every time it's, it's all about the comfort of people. Uh, you know, how do we make people comfortable with traveling? And um, I'm, I'm really proud that we were able to execute, you know, several hundred people in Orlando and everybody went home safe and healthy, um, you know, and, and by demonstrating that you can do that. Um, there's some th there are consumer behaviors that will will be with us forever that have changed as a result of COVID. I mean, our our personal comfort zones and, you know, the personal space has widely expanded. So, I mean, there are things that we are going to have to do, even if we have a vaccine. I mean, people are, are, are going to be more cautious. Um, and so, again, it's our, our opportunity as, as leaders in the travel industry to demonstrate as much as possible. And Caroline, I love that idea. I mean, those are it's just how you can show people that you can travel safely, how you can show people you can meet safely. And, and it can still be extraordinary experiences and people can still have great engagement, create, you know, commerce and, you know, buy and sell and create new relationships, but it doesn't have to go back to the, the, the old way of doing things. And that's not a bad thing. You know, we can, we yeah. can do that, but to the extent that what you're doing an ABA with a hundred, you know, a hundred webinars scheduled next year, that's unreal. But um, a big part of that is going to be just proving that people can, can do this safely and, um, and get back to business. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think um, I'm, I'm going to throw out there that, you know, we talked about sponsorship for a little while and how um, it was more important. We do, well, I should say, Will at the very beginning talked about conferences being more important than ever next year and in 22. Um, and I think sponsorship and getting, getting your company out there in a way that that you maybe weren't able to do before. So I would challenge everyone on our call that's tuning in and I would challenge all of our panelists as well to think about creating some really unique sponsorship opportunities. And I know we've all thought about it. We've all been think, talking about it um, that multiple entities can partner together to do. Not just, the, not just the one sponsor, but how do you have multiple entities in, in this time of really reduced budgets that regions can come together um, and work together to, to get a sponsorship out there and, and, and their name and logos out there for more people to see, more exposure. It, it's certainly the year to try new things. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew this hour was going to go fast. Um, we have nine minutes left. We're in our last nine minutes, and I feel like I could talk to you, and we could talk about this for another hour. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna start wrapping up here. Um, one question that that we always ask, um, whether it is um, a receptive tour operator, an international tour operator, or a domestic tour operator, is how the industry can help you. Um, and I think it still applies to our associations and our shows. Um, so what I'd like to know is everyone on this call wants to be in an event in person. Everyone on this call wants to help the association and the industry get back on its feet. So how can they get involved and how can they help you do that? Um, and I'm gonna put Carol Ann on the spot first because she's always good at questions like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think for us, certainly working in the school market, um, you know, we've been sensitive to how do we encourage people to travel, but recognizing for us that teachers just had a hard time getting, right? Parents getting kids back in school. And so helping us to craft the right messages, you know, really about getting travel started again in a way that is supportive of the industry and not to a backlash. And I want to recognize Malcolm and the team, certainly for your let's go when it's safe and Pete's messaging around moving forward. So I think if we can work together on the right messaging to promote travel, you know, and have it trickle down and that our industry is about an authentic, sincere, wanting to help people have these experiences in a safe way, it's still a challenge for us next year. And I think we're gonna to have to balance that together. So anything we can do in that way of getting travel started again would be really helpful. Love that. Will, any ideas? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, just continuing to stay engaged and doing what we're doing here and supporting each other. I think, again, when you can do one plus one and turn it into three, four or five, uh, the industry's done a really, really good job, I believe of suffering you know, as we hear from Roger Dow, I mean, it is our industry was just dis, disproportionately impacted by by the pandemic, and we're going to have to work together. Um, we're going to have to be supportive as possible as event organizers. We're going to have to come up with creative ways, like uh, ABA is doing, like Malcolm's doing with IPW, and uh, creative ways to bring as many people together as possible. Um, and then I think it starts at home, right? You know, this can support your local CVB and DMO and their initiatives to keep, uh, you know, to keep your community healthy. And, Get, get, get people kind of starting on the path of being comfortable getting out and traveling. So I think getting as engaged with your local community as possible, and then um, that'll end up benefiting us all. Love it. I'm just going in a circle on my screen here. Pete, what do you think? <laughs> I think a couple, couple of things. Uh, the industry collectively has already helped. I mean, everybody has been engaged, not only in the, the broader legislative efforts, getting more money for PPP, more money for small business, more money or money, certainly for the motor coach industry, but everybody's been involved in that process and try to help one another. So that's certainly got a big, big, big plus. Um, the, the other part of that is the fact that, that some of us, um, and I'll talk about you know, the tour operators in particular and the coach operators um, are bringing part of the recovery back to every community. So we are bringing people back, you know, as the recovery takes place, uh, communities want to get back to whatever the normal is. They need people to come. They need people to stay in hotels, eat in restaurants, shop. That's all part of what we're going to be doing is, is helping to enhance that recovery. 
But I think at the end of the day, you know, whatever we talk about, whatever we do, it's all about the customer, right? The, regardless of the business, it's all about customer first. And we've all got to be thinking collectively about how we make that experience for the customer. One that's make, going to make them feel comfortable, going to make them feel comfortable traveling again, be with groups, get on coaches, you know, school groups moving again. I mean, it's all part of what we need to look at going forward is putting that customer first and foremost. Absolutely. Malcolm, anything to add? Yeah, it's along those lines. I, I say, you know, restarting conferences, restarting travel, it, it's a partnership, not just on the organizer side, but the participant side. And we all need to, to be in this together. Um, we have to really respect that people have different comfort levels when they go back to being in a group setting. Um, and it, we really have to respect that. And, and it, it's two ways. We certainly don't want to be enforcers, any of us or any organization. You don't want to enforce rules on, on your guests. But we really need it to be a pact and a partnership that those coming to our events, those coming to our hotels or destinations are, are willing to play by the rules that are in place. They're hopefully temporary and they're hopefully just for now. Um, but, you know, a polite follow up from one exhibitor to the next or one delegate to the next, you know, about following a rule here and there. Um, we just have to be respectful of that. So, so it doesn't end up being the, the organizers or anybody in the call who deals with customers having to be the enforcers. Um, I think that's the only way to really get this, this industry restarted, get meetings restarted and get travel going again. Couldn't agree more. So we have one final question that's come in and a couple of comments that I just want to just want to touch base on before we wrap up. Um, talking about um, comp registrations um, for furloughed workers. Um, eTours and Summit did that for our, for our digital um, virtual event that we did in October to get people back on their feet. So, so the question was if any of the event, if any of the events next year will have that type of option um, or something similar to that. And if you can't answer the question right now, totally understand, but, uh, but certainly um, um, Anton who asked the question would like you to think about it. You know, whether it be um, what you're doing and combined memberships and registration or opportunities if, if individuals are still furloughed at the times of the shows to have some exposure. Um, to get back into the industry. You know, Sherry, that's uh, a great question. Um, something we, tr we tried at eTourism Summit and it was really, really successful. I think it's incumbent upon us as an industry um, to do our best to maintain the talent that we have in the industry and not have them all, uh, you know, get furloughed out of travel and get sucked up into a different industry. We would lose way too much talent. Um, so we're, we're committed to connect travel to providing those kind of opportunities if it's virtual or, or, or live. But I think it's an important, uh, and there's been some great initiatives uh, around the industry of trying to help you know help connect uh, help connect people. I know every every day in the tra every week in the travel vertical, we've got a list of every travel job out there. You know, doing our best to help people um, stay in the industry is going to be is going to be important because we're, we're going to have to work harder than we've ever had to work, and it's of everybody in the industry. It, it was a pretty fun 10 year ride. So we want to keep those pros uh, here because we're gonna have to fight and claw for, for all of our business moving forward. Yeah, and certainly I, I, I know IPW needs a lot of volunteers. I imagine uh, ABA and CIDA probably rely on the host city, rely on a lot of volunteers. That'd be a great way to interact. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that quite a bit. I mean, we want this to be a gathering point when we meet in Baltimore in June and we want those people to come back and be a part of the show. Uh, if, if they're out of work for no no fault of their own, you know, we need to do everything we can to help them. And this is the time to do it. Absolutely. And as you're talking volunteers, I was thinking volunteers and Lisa was already putting up on the chat. We can be useful <laughs> volunteers. So I think um, we, we know what a show looks like and everyone on the call does as well. So um, I was going to say to, to everyone on the call, um, you need to tell us what you need as well. If you know there was a couple comments about budget and that being the biggest challenge, if the budget is an issue, call us and let us know. Everyone on this panel um, are very open and have open door policies. You can email them, you can call them, and they are willing to talk to you about whatever whatever you're thinking or need. So let us know what you need to be successful. Let us know how we can help, and let us know how all of that works into the show. Um, I think collectively the theme of, of this particular webinar was working together and, and how we do that moving forward. So 
Um, I We are right at two o'clock. I thank you for being on the call. Um, Carol Ann, Pete, Malcolm, Will, thank you for taking your time. Time uh, is, is something that is not easily come by when we're sitting on webinar after webinar after webinar. So I appreciate you taking the time and letting everyone on this call know what's uh, going on next year and what the plans are. Um, and know that plans are, are always moving based on this crazy uncertainty that we're living in. So reach out and let us know what you need and how we can help you. And, and I'm sure all of our panelists will let you know how you can help them as well. Um, this was amazing. It's going to be on demand. So you can go to our uh, website, connecttravel.com backslash webinars, or is it front slash webinars? I always get those confused. Um, or to our YouTube channel, so you can have that and share it with your members or your associates. Um, we're happy to do that for you. And we will be back next week with our last webinar for the year. Um, and it's going to be a year in the review. I'm not going to tell you who's on it because we're going to have people popping in here and there. And it's going to be pretty cool and fun. And we're just going to be talking about the year and wrapping up before the holidays. Um, if we don't see you next week, have wonderful holidays. Um, and thank you for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.